Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajay. And at the outset, I like to thank the whole team of Hormone India for giving me this opportunity. And without wasting much of time, I'll start my presentation. And most of the things I think uh, Dr. Uh, Sachin has already uh, pointed out about the Cushing's disease. I had prepared some of the uh, basic slides regarding the uh, Cushing's disease, uh, the, the uh, diagnosis. So I will skip about the history of Cushing's syndrome per se. Yes, we should all know that this Cushing syndrome is basically ACTS dependent in more than 50% of the cases. Ectopic ACTS production, 25% CRH dependent and ACTH independent in about 20% of the patients. And <clears throat> we all know, as such, Dr. Sachin has pointed out very well, that it becomes sometimes really confusing and difficult to diagnose cases of the ACTH dependent pituitary uh, adenoma or uh, ectopic ACTH dependent Cushing's disease. <clears throat> However, many ectopic sources are occult and identification of the source secretion may require meticulous and repeated investigation. Brief overview, I will not go in detail. This we have already discussed about, yes, plasma ACTH less than 5, usually ACTH independent and we need a adrenal imaging. And if there are no adrenal lesions, then it may be a exogenous or PPLAD. But if the plasma ACTH levels are more than 50 picograms per ml, it is basically ACTH dependent. We should get a pituitary MRI. And as very well pointed out by Dr. Chittawar, that now we have got better MRIs, a 3T MRI or even higher than that can very well show us a smallest of microadenomas. And positive CRH suppression on dexamethasone, he has already pointed out, gives us a diagnosis of Cushing's disease. And yes, BIPs can also be done. And if, it, if there is no ACTH gradient, then we should go for a CT MRI thorax abdomen. This is imaging. You can see here that how comparing between 1.5 T MRI and a 3T MRI gives us a very clear picture here. <clears throat> you may not be able to appreciate. This is a quite uh, busy and small slide, but you can see here the arrows with 1.5 Tesla MRI. The microadenoma is not visible, but with 3T MRI in both the cases, it is quite visible. And again, BIPS is recommended in patients with inconclusive results. We have seen 70 MRI may preempt IPSS and help in diagnosing against the standard 1.5 and 3T MRI negative Cushing's disease cases in future. So we are now, we would be having 70 MRIs which can help us. Ectopic ACTH can be diagnosed with the help of 18F FDG PET, gallium dotate PET and CTN octreotide. IPSS gold standard, I will not go in detail. We have different confusions, different types of hypercortisolemia like cyclical Cushing's, <coughs> pseudo Cushing's and depression in pregnancy also. Here, I come directly to the algorithm of the management of Cushing's disease, then I would be starting on the medical management. So when the Cushing's disease is confirmed, first line therapy, is advised a surgery, the removal of the micro or macro adenoma. If there is no remission or there is a recurrence, we can go for a repeat MRI again, 3T or above it if it is available. If there is a tumor available on MRI and it is non-resectable, we can go for radiation with interior medications also. And if it is persistent, we all know we have to knock off both the adrenals. And if on recurrence the tumor is resectable, we can repeat the surgery. On the other side, 
we see hypercortisolemia and no MRI, no tumor on mri <clears throat> we can start patient on medication or if it is persistent even on medication we can go for the radiation therapy and last if we don't get any relief with medication radiation a redo surgery again the last option left is bilateral adenoid so this is in short the algorithm for the management of cushing's disease treatment obviously surgery is the first choice if we see a micro or macro adenoma you know endocrine society has produced various evidence based practical guidelines for the treatment of cushing's syndrome and it should be a team approach agun go for surgeries yes medical therapies for cushing's disease what are the indications of medical therapy so when we should start thinking of medical therapy in a cushing's disease <clears throat> mind it the best therapy is surgery surgical resection of the pituitary adenoma but then we have some indications for medical therapy like management of the high cortisol levels when surgery is contraindicated we may get a lot of our patients because of various comorbidities happen due to hypercortisolism pre operative preparation of the patient also who need to rapidly correct severe complications of the disease like infections severe hypertension and acute psychosis due to hypercortisolism and control of cortisol excess during the period between irradiation and complete response to pituitary radiotherapy this also we know because it takes time after radiation we may immediately not get the benefit it may take weeks or months for response to the radiotherapy so these are some of the indications for medical therapy and this is in short you can see for pituitary disease we have neuromodulators of acth leads which are only for cushing disease the pasiriotide and cabergolin directly acting at the pituitary level but then we have adrenal steroidogenesis inhibitors also like ketoconazole metoprolol mitotan and etomidate which can take care of all the causes of hypercortisolemia whether it is acts dependent or independent so we'll talk about adrenal steroidogenesis inhibitors the metoprolol which basically inhibits cortisol secretion by blocking the final step in cortisol synthesis namely the conversion from 11 deoxy cortisol by the cytochrome p450 enzyme the 11 hydroxylase and here the serum cortisol levels fall within 2 hours of starting the therapy but the effect is short lived and metoprolol requires to be taken three times daily <clears throat> the usual dose ranges from 250 mg twice daily to up to 1.5 g every 6 hours with lower doses for adrenal adenoma and higher doses required for ectopic acth and it is effective in about 50% of the cases the commonest side effect is nausea and it should be differentiated from the nausea due to adrenal insufficiency ketoconazole imidazole used as an antifungal but it blocks variety of steroidogenic cytochrome p450 dependent enzymes so lowers the plasma cortisol level treatment is usually initiated with 200 mg thrice daily and adjusted depending upon the serum cortisol levels we can adjust the dose between 400 to 1200 mg per day and an acidic stomach is needed for absorption so we should tell our patients to avoid ppis 
And in clinical practice, again, this drug is effective in around 50% of the patients. And an additional desirable characteristics of ketoconazole is that it lowers the serum cholesterol levels also, which is commonly seen in patients with Cushing syndrome. So it has got other metabolic benefits also. It has got a slower onset of action than metirapone, and those adjustments should be made every two to three weeks because it takes time to see the <coughs> benefit. Although the patients with adrenal adenomas, they respond rapidly and hypoadrenalism can occur within 24 hours also. So maybe go slow, watch every 15, 20 days, two to three weeks. And consistently, it induces a reversible rise in liver transaminase and GGT levels. So liver functions should be done regularly. And it is teratogenic for male fetus and it is contraindicated in pregnancy. Then coming to etomidate. Again, this is imidazole and its principal use as an aesthetic agent. It is at a subhypnotic dose, IV. It is a potent inhibitor of cortisol secretion. And the use of IV at subhypnotic doses is an option when oral adrenalytic therapy is not possible. But it requires ICU monitoring. Though in some palliative situation, cases of dominant treatment via subcutaneous pump has also been reported. The doses are 1.2 2.5 mg per hour, which lowers the cortisol level to even sometimes a undetectable level. And the patient needs to maintain on a block and replace regime with concomitant use of IV hydrocortisone. So, so here also, like in thyroid views, we can have block and replace regime for a balanced and better control. The mitoten, it has been used widely for the treatment of cortisol excess due to inoperable adenocortical carcinomas. But when given at a lower dose, it can effectively control the cortisol secretion in benign cases of Cushing syndrome. It has got a direct adrenolytic action. It destroys adrenocortical cells, but also blocks the cortisol synthesis. It has got a slow onset of action. The first effects are usually observed within two weeks, but changes in dose usually require six weeks or more to be fully effective. Then we have this latest drug, the oscillodrostat, which is a newer inhibitor of 11-beta hydroxylase with greater potency and longer duration of action compared to metirapone that shows promise for the treatment of Cushing's disease. We have glucocorticoid receptor blockade also like mifepristone, which is a potent antagonist that blocks cortisol action and reverses the consequences of hypercortisolemia. But then efficacy of action is determined by clinical assessment because already the cortisol levels are high. So we cannot just measure cortisol level in this case. And this may result in hypokalemia because of the action of cortisol binding to the mineralocorticoid receptor. Then we have those direct centrally acting somatostatin analogs like octreotide and glenriotide it binds predominantly to SSTR subtype 2 which are generally ineffective in Cushing's disease but multi-receptor somatostatin analog like passeriotide demonstrates a high affinity to SSTR subtypes 1, 2, 3, and 5, which normalizes the urinary free cortisol in about 17 to 40% of patients of Cushing's disease, depending on their severity. And the problem is hyperglycemia being the commonest side effect. Then we have a very commonly used drug, cabargolin which has been also assessed in the treatment of Cushing's disease. It lowers cortisol level and hence the ACTH also. And in recent large 
just series has shown 20 to 25% of patients have achieved good UFC using modest doses. Just 1 mg per week, 0.5 mg twice a week can be given to get desired results. Sorry for this busy slide, but these are some of the latest medications which have been used in Cushing's disease. I won't go in detail. Most of the drugs I have talked about and few are the latest medications. And then patients who are hypocortisolemic in the immediate post-operative period, they require glucocorticoid therapy, which may take up to 16 to 18 months post-operatively. So this should be taken care. This is post-op patient. We have to see few people they give only for few weeks or months the glucocorticoid therapy, but studies have shown that patients may take 6 to 18 months for HP access to recover and suppression of normal serum cortisol on dexamethasone testing in the post-operative period is a poor indicator for long-term remission. Complications of surgery, I won't go in much detail. Other modalities, adrenal surgery, I have talked about pituitary radiotherapy and stereotactic radio surgery also. Role of radiotherapy, I won't talk much. This is the management of persistent or recurrent Cushing's disease. A pituitary surgery, again, transphenodal adenomyomectomy, remission, just follow up every 6 to 12 weeks. Persistence or relapse is there, go for pituitary radiotherapy, remission, just follow up. Repeat the pituitary surgery. If there is a failure, go for medical therapy. And if these they don't work, go for adrenal surgery. So to conclude, the treatment of Cushing's disease is one of the most challenging tasks in endocrinology. And differentiation of Cushing's disease from other underlying causes of Cushing's syndrome is difficult. Surgery remains the first-line treatment for almost all CD patients and most tumors are microtumors. And TSS is therefore an appropriate approach. Persistent or recurrent Cushing's disease after unsuccessful surgery needs further treatment, including a repeat surgery, medical therapy, radiotherapy, or in few cases, bilateral adenectomy also. Repeat surgery should be considered in patient in whom distinct and accessible tumor is visible on MRI. But it is usually associated with relatively high rates of failure and recurrences. Medical therapies, they include adrenal steroidogenesis inhibitors, tumor-directed drugs, and glucocorticoid receptor antagonists. And combinations of these therapies have been tried and have shown to be quite effective with less side effects rather than using a single therapy. Thank you.